Assalamu alaikum. You're watching Views and News and I'm Faisal Rahman live from our Islamabad studios. Today's top story, the first story is about that Punjab government and Exim Bank sign orange line agreement and that is about a metro train um, which will be technically bisecting Lahore and a lot of people will benefit out of that. And this is going to be one of its kind in Pakistan. So we'll be talking about that in detail that what exactly it is about. And the second one is about the ongoing Karachi operation where the development is that uh, Dr. Asim Hussain's case uh, from the Ranger side seems to be very weak and uh, the current investigation officer DSP Iltaf Hussain has said that uh, all those charges framed against him uh, were not right and technically the previous investigation officer was very biased and was in favor of Rangers. This is exactly what he meant today when he said that and uh, let's see where it leads and what exactly happens and uh, the third story is about uh, I won't say the uh, you know the, that the Hilden has been captured. Hilden is one province, it's one of the largest provinces in Afghanistan, and actually one of its border is with uh, Balochistan. It's long in length, and the best part is that um, there are certain pockets, certain areas, certain districts within Hilden, uh, which are in absolute control of the Taliban, and this is one of the uh, provinces where the hold of the Taliban seems to be very significant, very important. And a lot of uh, history it holds, actually, interestingly, when you look at the past. The third story is going to be about um, Pakistan Super League, auction of the players. It's a very interesting story. We'll show you a package on that. And let's see. Uh, I mean, there were five categories, interestingly. First one was platinum. The second one was diamond, gold, silver. And the, and the fifth was, I think, ordinary or struggling or something of that sort. So we'll be talking about that also in our fourth segment. We're talking about the first one, about the orange line. Uh, train and the uh, agreement between Punjab government and the Exim Bank. Let's watch this report first. Exim Bank China and the government of Pakistan have signed an historic loan agreement to fund the construction of the Orange Line project in Lahore City. Charge the affairs at the Chinese embassy in Pakistan, Chao Li Chian congratulated Exim Bank and the Punjab government on the signing of the agreement. Chief Minister Shahbaz Sharif speaking on the occasion highlighted the role of China in funding infrastructure and development projects in Pakistan and thanked the Chinese leadership for their support. So I would like to express my deepest appreciation and gratitude to President Xi Jinping, Premier Li, for providing this wonderful support and a battery of gifts, be it CPAC projects or Orange Line. And most definitely, Orange Line will remain forever as a living and everlasting symbol of Pakistan-China friendship. Speaking on the occasion, the Minister for Planning and Development, Ehsan Iqbal, said that China-Pakistan Economic Corridor will usher a new era of progress and prosperity for all the provinces of the country. He said that energy projects being implemented under the CPEC will help overcome shortage of energy in the country. The rate of urbanization in Pakistan is higher than any other country in South Asia. And that poses unique challenges for our economy and our society. Finance Minister Isaac Da said that under the leadership of Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif, the country is moving forward in the right direction. He said that the economic indicators have been changed from minus to plus as a result of steps taken by the government. We had a two-year goal to reverse the internationally declared Pakistan economy as macroeconomic and stable economy. Thanks God. Not only we have averted the default, the country which was having nine days of import reserves with it today has more than six months of forex reserves in its kitty. And that was uh, the finance minister, Isaac Darsab. And uh, earlier you heard uh, the other minister. And uh, interestingly, Shabash Sharif also spoke about it. And now this orange train mega project. I think this is going to be one of the most expensive and the largest projects in Pakistan. Uh, I think this is the dream of the Prime Minister to make it look like a modern city, a modern country, and especially when, once you talk about uh, Lahore. Now, a lot of uh, development work is going on.
I mean, Lahore seems to be the focus for uh, development at the moment. Even in Islamabad, if you travel around, you'll see a lot of development going on, a lot of bridges being constructed. Uh, though the original beauty was about uh, the green Islamabad, but still, whenever the population grows, obviously, this has to happen. You, you can't stop that, but you can manage it in an appropriate way. Anyway, time to move on to our next segment, and that is about the uh, authority given to the uh, Karachi Rangers for the next 60 days. Uh, but they are just only limit to certain areas, and they can't function on uh, cases like corruption, for instance. This is going to be an interesting debate. We'll show you a report first, then I'll introduce you to our guest, and we'll talk about it. A large number of weapons and ammunition was recovered as Rangers personnel carried out raids in different parts of Lyari and Bhempura areas of Karachi. According to a Rangers spokesperson, 14 SMGs, 5 rifles, 8 pistols, 41 homemade bombs and hundreds of bullets were recovered during the raids. A seven-member delegation of all Karachi Traders Union held a meeting with the Rangers DG, Major General Bilal Akbar. The delegation informed the Rangers DG about its security concerns in case the targeted operation in Karachi is stopped. In a resolution passed by the Sindh Assembly, PPP government curtailed Rangers' powers in carrying out law enforcement duties. On a visit to Rangers headquarters, Corps Commander Karachi Lieutenant General Naveed Mukhtar praised their achievements and sacrifices for restoring Karachi law and order. The sticking point between the Rangers and the ruling Pakistan People's Party is the arrest of former Petroleum Minister Dr. Asim Hussain over alleged charges of land grabbing, money laundering and financial misappropriation. The rift seems to have widened as Rangers moved Sindh High Court against the replacement of the Sindh public prosecutor. The opposition in Sindh too has become active to forge a grand alliance against the provincial government. Karachi operation has significantly reduced violence and any foot dragging might create a security vacuum. Though every effort must be made to ensure fair play, it must be guaranteed that no political cover is allowed to criminal and corrupt elements. Rangers doing a lot in Karachi and even last night they picked up 30 people from various areas and various operations and 20 of those people were from band outfits. So we should get credit to the Rangers, they were exactly they're doing. But can they do, can they, I mean there is a certain uh, power authorized now. You know you can work within given parameters. But there is a certain expectation associated from the Rangers at the same time. Now, within those given parameters and then the expectation which seems to be pretty high, how will they manage that? Let's talk about it. We have with us Dr. Okap, so thank you very much thank for you. taking out your time and talking to us. Dr. Okap, tell us, I mean, you know, when you mean, I mean, obviously responsibility and authority, they're both related. If you expect me to be responsible, you need to give me a certain amount of authority to deliver. But don't you think there seems to be a mismatch here? The authority has been limited. And the responsibility, I mean, that has also mounted. How do you see that? Well, let's look at when you limit somebody's capacity to do something, automatically responsibility incre increases. Because those areas where they're not able to implement their actions impinge upon those areas that they can and aggravate the situation further. So now you've limited responsibility, uh, sorry, increasing responsibility, limited the capability to implement their actions on That's the ground, correct. so you've tied their hands together. Mm -hmm. And this doesn't bode well for Pakistan, especially Karachi. Now, if you look at this, this will be taken advantage of by those parties that can go through those areas where the, the, the region's hands are tied down, which is going to automatically affect an increase in disruption in those areas where the ranges can, which means it's got to do more to conflict with it. There's no comprehensive ability to do anything. You've got to tie people you think down. That, but, you, 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 you're expecting you, that sure. much, and you know the authority is very limited. Things will go wrong. This is what it looks it, like. It is, it is going to go wrong all over the place. Sir. So, then is it a wise by solution? Is that the right choice? And today, it's absolutely not. To accept today, Dr. Asim's case, it is really weakened now. Uh, Dr. Asim seems to be the person who is going to be, you know, will be given a free walk away. What can we say when we can't Honestly target anybody? <laughs> When, when a person's case is automatically uh, reduced, it highlights one thing. Maybe it's because the incapacity of the rangers to do something, or maybe the hands are tied now and they can't do anything. And as a result, you reduce their ability to do it further. And in the public limelight, their inability, therefore, to progress this further uh, produces an impact on the perceptions of the people who are watching them doing things and those parties who are against this process altogether anyway who 
are there who are the bandits, who are the terrorists, or who are the corrupt people, are going to take advantage of this. They're the winners, not the Rangers and not the public of Karachi. Now we've got to look at it. Mm -hmm. The public perceptions are going to go down. Their sense of insecurity is going to go up. This is exactly and what does that happen? People are insecurity. Really I mean, because the overall result, when you look at the numbers, I mean, 60% crime rate. Well, Straight insecurity away, goes down. up. What happens? People take advantage of the insecurity, which further increases insecurity. It's a security dilemma. And then everybody's going to polarize again, and you're going to have this disruption again. 60 days? That's nothing. 60 days? What is 60 days? You need to increase the capacity, not reduce it. And now this is just a, 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 a loudspeaker for those criminal elements and the terrorists. To rise there. again and do now whatever to, they were doing Now before. let's come up and let's make deals and do something under the government's belt and uh, undermine the government overall. So they've just stabbed themselves in the back, the government has. So who won in this situation? Sorry? Who won in this situation? Well, the government, there was, there was a the government thinks the they won, but they've actually the lost. Government. Now, interestingly, if you, if you look at this uh, from a very different perspective, actually a very obvious perspective, that whenever there was a statement by the government officials, I'm talking about whether the Sindh government or the federal government, uh, there was this visit of uh, the Corps Commander Karachi to the Rangers uh, headquarters, appreciating the general as well as his team. So that was also a message sent straight away. Okay, so we can do that. Though. We can do that. So don't you think there's going to be some sort of a collision at some stage, honestly speaking? You think it's happening all around the country? It is happening in a way. But I'm where, where governance it. isn't taken its where response. The where the decision would be challenged. Because earlier, if you remember, when they were not giving extension to the rangers. Mm -hmm. Rangers, they were still conducting operations. So that was a message from them to them also. But, but that was also a message. But there was also another thing. The Interior Ministry hasn't, hadn't withdrawn the rangers. Now, there's a challenge between Sin government and federal government here. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a conflict here, a conflict of interest. And it's an inter-party conflict as well. There's no doubt about that. Let's not kid ourselves. Uh, it's a turf so battle. It has it's a turf battle, also. and mm -hmm. the people in Karachi are the mm -hmm. ones that are going to suffer. And as a result of Karachi suffering, Pakistan is going to suffer. That being the hub of the trade, and that's where the money goes, and everything's going to dry up. I mean, that's uh, an extreme exaggeration, but you can look at the extremes where, where you set off on a course towards a decline, this is how it's set. So we've got to readjust what we're doing, drastically change events around, and empower our law enforcement uh, agencies to conduct the operations, as they deem fit, against criminal, terrorist, and corrupt elements. And corruption, I assure you, is part and parcel of the whole game of terrorism. They feed on corruption, and that's why they proliferate everywhere. Because everything is interlinked. Absolutely. You need, you need to know, no, you can't break one and balance it out. Absolutely. You need to do it and go after everything. Once the power is diluted, obviously, you know, all those criminals, miscreants, all those people involved, all sort of wrongdoings, they're thinking also. They're watching television too, just like us. And they're making their own plans too. Uh, at the same time, when you look at this uh, Operation Zarbia, we've been told that almost 70% of the operation is over. And they've got, but there are certain pockets in the Sawal area where there are problems. And they will remain like that. Winter is there. I mean, things out there, I mean, won't be on, on the ground much, but through the air. So you mean that technically there could be another extension of six months on that front as far as the final operation, I mean, which we call the logical conclusion. What is a logical to conclusion? That to hold things and hand it over to the government to run. Is the government going to do that? Is the government has, I mean, the question is not about whether they'll do it or not. Whether do they, they have, have the capacity, capacity to do it, yeah. Are they going to create the capacity? They're not creating capacity when they take, tie hands of the law enforcement agencies. Now you look at, in Fata, you look at the operations since 2008, in Bajor, in South Rizistan, now North Rizistan, for example, if these are given over, what's going to happen? A lack of law enforcement. That means they're going to run right. They can never be a vacuum in political uh, uh, control of a particular territory. Because as soon as one party leaves, another comes in and fills it. There's, that's guaranteed anywhere in the world. There are elements out there that take advantage of the writ or the lack of the writ of the government in any particular area. If of there any is country. a void, so it is going to be filled in. Simple Absolutely. Well. You push the water away, hmm. it comes down from the other side. And this is what's going to happen in any part of the country where there is not consistent law enforcement and the government doesn't enforce its writ on that particular area, wherever that might be in this country or any other country in the world. Every government is responsible to those people and that territory within its control unless they give it up.
and we don't want that. So if you take away the powers, inevitably what you've actually done is given up your writ consciously. And that is treason as far as I see it. Article 6, technically speaking. Yep. Well, let's talk to Mubashir Zaidi who's online with us. Assalamu alaikum, Mubashir. Hello. Hello. Mubashir, assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum, how are you? Can, can you hear me loud and clear? Because sir, you'll have to speak a little louder. Yes, I think... Hello? I, I think there's some technical problem. But anyway, sir, continuing. Uh, now, Karachi is one segment. You're talking about Waziristan, that's a different ball game, but that is another problem and a half. You're talking about Balochistan. I had a word with a few of the people, two of my cousins actually, they were in the army. They were over from, from there actually. And uh, interestingly, uh, things are in control, but you have to maintain that control through people in uniform. What does that, that shouldn't be the what, case. What does that do? When the army is there too long, perception of the people would be, this is an army of occupation. Occupation. This is Even absolutely if there's a contrary. school and there's a flag of Pakistan there, you'll see two gunmen, two men in uniform just to look after those people. But, but the point is, when you've got a prolonged uh, ground operations and enforcement law and order by people in uniform in khakis, perception of people changes over time when they think this is particularly an occupation then. And that can be taken advantage of by the militants. This is what has happened in Balochistan. And that, as a result, it's a complete contradiction to what you actually went out to do. And it reverses your progress that you went out to do. And what happens then is the government loses even further risk. This is what happened in Bhutto's case, if you remember. Yes. Exactly and the same and so, so what we're doing is when the government doesn't pull in the governance in those areas and take the responsibility as they should do, because that's what they're elected for, they're elected to take part of governing the country. Absolutely. And they're not doing so. Let's talk about law enforcement agencies, the hierarchy. Army, or let's suppose SSG is the top, then Army, then you have Rangers or FCs. And well, it depends on what type I mean, of And then you have got even scouts. They used to be yeah. scouts FC also. Yeah. I think police needs to be in part. I mean, the biggest problem with them, I mean, it's not only about Sindh. It's everywhere, even in Punjab. I think Punjab is, in that terms, a little higher than even Sindh. That police is politicized. No matter what we claim, no matter what we do, we keep on hearing cases on television, and you exactly know what I'm talking about, sir. You, if you empower them, they take advantage of their power. If you reduce their power, that becomes another problem. Do you really think high time to talk about police reforms? Forget Because, you know, if police is there, it makes more sense. Mm -hmm. Because the different uniform people understand their role in their job, to protect and to serve. Mm -hmm. But army is supposed to be for the borders. Those green or brown uniform is supposed to look after your frontiers. With the exception but, but, of the okay, ranges. Okay. But, uh, ranges, I mean, yeah. whenever there's a problem, you can yeah. call them. But I'll also put this question to you, but before that, so we have been joined by the former IG. Uh, uh, Shigri Sahib, Assalamu Alaikum. Assalamu Alaikum. Shigri Sahib, talking about the police uniform, my uh, friend here, Ukab Malik, has raised a very important point. He says wherever there's a problem and then the army takes an action or the rangers does something, uh, then there's a void. Police doesn't have the capacity. The political parties, they do not have the capacity, neither the will. And unfortunately, the uh, spell of the military to stay there that, that gets longer. And then, you know, people start thinking as if it's an occupation or something. And he's very right. I totally agree with him. Do you think this is high time to empower police? And so would you like to also an answer that if we empower them at the same time, they misuse that power. But how can you bring in reforms in police at the same time where they're empowered, they're taught, and, you know, at least the, the motto should be to protect and to serve rather than to beat and, and loot? As a matter of fact, the police... Uh, is, is, is trained to sort of serve and work with the community. And it, it, it has a, a, definitely a different uh, uh, mindset than the, than the armed forces. The armed forces are trained in a totally a different environment and for a different role. So I think uh, there is a need to uh, reform the police. And I think our efforts to reform the police, unfortunately, has not gone through. Because the politicians don't want to leave the police, they want to sort of interfere with their work, uh, work interfere with their recruitment, their promotions, their training, and uh, even their day-to-day uh, -day functions. Unless or until you do that, you will never have a reformed police. Mm -hmm. And as long as you do not have a reformed police, you will never be able to have an effective police. So that is what is happening in, in Karachi and the Sindh. 
And I think you, you talk of the shortage of the police force in Karachi. You know, I was just checking up. They have something like 122 police uh, policemen in the entire province. Even in the short term, they can always shift something like five to 6,000 people to Karachi and, and, and uh, deal with the situation. I think they just do not have the will. They want somebody else to do their work. That is the problem. So I think uh, we, we, it is time. Yes, it is time to reform the police. It is time to allow the people of Pakistan to live a normal life. I think we... But Shigri Sahib, Shigri Sahib, if, if you may allow me, if I may ask you a question. Let's suppose you're given this task to reform police and you're given absolute authority to do it. How long will it take? What needs to be done? And how <laughs> it needs to be done, sir? I think it's just so simple. In 2002, uh, we came up with the reform of the police, but unfortunately, everybody dubbed it that this is a dictator's I reform, was the and therefore it that was time. just sort of done away with. I think, but he himself lost interest in the reforms, and in 2004, those reforms were sort of deformed, as a matter of fact. And uh, all that you could do empower them, give them the full authority and have a very, very strict accountability. And the accountability has to be credible. Accountability has to be beyond any political considerations. If you do that, things will start improving. But if you look for a police chief who will be compliant, if you look for a weak police chief, then I think you can never have um, any good results. Put a strong man there, empower him, let him work. He, he misbehaves, get rid of him, take action against him, dismiss him. We are not prepared to do that. We want a compliant policeman. And the compliant policeman is no policeman. He is just a personal servant of somebody. Hmm. Absolutely. Spot on, sir. Totally agree with you. Thank you very much, Shigri sir. Now, we've raised some very important points. I mean, you know, everything is so politicized, for example. And, you know, you have people of your own choice in order to make sure that whatever happens in your area should be within your control. That is why you mm -hmm. need to have the SHO of your own choice, the SP at a larger level of your own choice, so that you can control. It's all about authority. And interestingly, you know, you know exactly what, what happens when that is given to you, granted to you. Do you think these local body elections, they've been held in Pakistan, though it took three phases, but finally they've, they've done it. But there are no powers with them, technically speaking. Money from the chief minister, rest, they've got nothing in their control. Do you think there's going to be another clash? I mean, these are the real people's representatives, I mean. And those people have the authority, but they do not have the authority. And the responsibility is huge again. There's another direct conflict, isn't it? Well, I think there's a, a different layered responsibility. You've got a larger representative of district or tessil, for example, and you've got lower level representatives, and it all works together. It should do. But you know how- It has to, and it, 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 to, to make it work, it has to. But you know, as human nature goes, uh, there's conflicts of interest, the stubbornness, one of the biggest problems we have here is everybody wants to be in authority and everybody wants to stop the work because they want to be recognized for the position they're in. Mm -hmm. And that's a blockage in bureaucracy. Every bureaucratic system here blocks things from working. Honestly, that reminds me of Maslow, the hierarchy of needs. One of the needs is power, yeah. absolute power. Absolutely. You know? This go. is the best in ideas. I mean, from Thomas Hobbes, the idea the war is always going to be there. Even though there's a superficial idea that it is not there, and you've got something working because you've got people placed in different levels, mm -hmm. they're actually fighting with each other, yeah. not, to, not to allow things to work. Because that's all about mentality. That's all about the cultural attitude towards who you are. That needs and to be addressed. That, takes a that needs to be that addressed. Years, yes. And are we going to address that? And it all fundamentally comes down to well, society. Well, unfortunately, change. we normally even are very lucky if even the general problems are addressed and you know at, at a dog basis but mm -hmm. the problem is that you know when you're talking about long-term strategic plan mm -hmm. it takes at least 50 60 70 years it does. nobody thinks beyond the next election <laughs> uh, that, that's where the problem lies that we need to have a strategic vision time to country. move on to our next segment and interestingly dr Kaab, that is about hillman that is something of uh, interest, interest to, to you at least exactly awesome. so we'll show you a report and then we'll continue right from there Afghan Taliban laid siege and captured Sangin district of Afghanistan's Helmand province today. The district fell after fierce fighting between the Taliban and Afghan forces, which left 90 soldiers dead. The clashes have been going on for days in Giresk and Sangin districts. Fierce fighting was reported around the police headquarters in Sangin. 
The deputy governor of Helmand, Mohammed Jan Rasulyar, took to Facebook and said there was a lack of government support for his province. The deputy governor addressed President Ashraf Ghani in his open letter on Facebook. He urged the president to protect the province from the Taliban offensive. He further added that Helmand was not like Kunduz, and if it falls to the Taliban, regaining control will not be as simple as launching an operation from the airport. Taliban briefly took the northern city of Kunduz in September, their biggest victory in the 14 years of war. The fall of Helmand will prove to be a devastating blow to the NATO-backed forces. December marks a year since the U.S.-led NATO mission transitioned into an Afghan-led operation. U.S. President Barack Obama had earlier announced that contrary to his previous plans, thousands of U.S. troops will stay in Afghanistan post-2016. He acknowledged that Afghan forces were not yet ready to stand alone. In the recent months, Taliban have launched multiple attacks on Afghan forces. Afghan forces have repelled many attacks and regained control of Kunduz. However, the constant offensive have left the Afghan army short of fuel, ammunition and reinforcements. Welcome back after the report now. We have been joined by Hassan Khan Sahib, a known journalist. Uh, so thank you very much for thank taking time much. and talking to us. Earlier sir, we were talking about, you know, we were having a word about Karachi and all. Now, Helmand. It's one of the largest province, uh, provinces in Afghanistan, sir, directly attached with Pakistan and Balochistan. And now there are certain districts in absolute control of the Taliban. Isn't it a threat for us? Let's start off from there, sir. I think this is uh, yesterday when I, uh, when I saw the report from the deputy governor telling uh, that asking, I rather. asking, mm -hmm. asking him to, uh, to give attention to the helmet. It is falling. Uh, it's maybe falling to the, into the hands of militant. And though the, the report was denied later, but denied in a way that uh, we have a tactical retreat. Uh, when another uh, senior officer says there is a tactical retreat and uh, uh, the, the Afghan forces are in, um, are in control uh, of the situation. But you know, uh, I think the situation, I, I'm just back from Kabul and uh, we spent uh, a week almost a year in Kabul. Okay. The, the situation there, I think it is very fluid and any time... Very fluid. Very fluid, very much fluid. In the streets of Kabul, you can under, you can smell that uh, that there is something going on and there is, uh, there is a huge fear. Uh, even an ordinary person, you ask him, so you definitely understand that he is undergoing some troubles, uh, that maybe uh, there is an attack, uh, there will be so an the attack. the control of the miscreants, that's getting more. Not only I think physically, but also emotionally. Psychologically. Yeah, psychologically. I think psychologically, uh, everybody in Kabul. And that is a big win, by the way. I, I think uh, uh, we met with the, with the journalists, with civil society people. Uh, we have a meeting with Dr. Abdullah and with, uh, with President Karzai also. Okay. And I think everybody was, was almost talking the same thing. It, it was very strange for me. Everybody was talking uh, almost the same thing. And everybody was preoccupied uh, with, the, with the Taliban uh, coming over and taking and, de and dislodging the legitimate government. But simultaneously, they were telling us that it is the Pakistan government mm. which is supporting the Taliban. And they are going to uh, destabilize the legitimate government. Why do the they have that kind of a perception, sir? I think the perception is so deeply engraved. Uh, that, uh, so, uh, through the but, media also, by the way? I, I think media also. And another thing, I, uh, when we landed in Kabul and the first, uh, the, 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 the catchy headline, which almost all the newspaper carried, was the statement of Indian ambassador. And I was just talking about how deeply in, entrenched the Indian influence is uh, in Kabul. So and they are doing it so smartly that we can't even think of. For example, they've invested there. So that's a very positive thing. Indira Gandhi University. Nehru and Gandhi. symbols. So I'm just giving they're, they're you symbols. Symbols. So, symbols okay, yeah. Indians, good people. When it comes to Pakistan, I mean, look at the uh, way the Iranian media is operating in mm -hmm. uh, Afghanistan. Look at the way the Indian media and influences there. When you talk about their strategy, any sort of strategy, you know. The the Indians just, are right just there. Just let me Even I've heard that there are uh, advisors in their uh, intelligence. Many, in every Indian advisors. In every department. But that's uh, uh -huh. diplomatic course are all trained in, in India. And the, the soldiers, the ranks are the, the officers are trained so the in India. So the next generation, well. which is the mindset, is there in, exactly automatic, and that is what matters. It does matter because they, they look upon Pakistan as an enemy state now. Absolutely, hey, Faisal, just to quote one, uh, if you allow me. No I matter what we say, they are Muslim brothers. What Muslim brothers? I, 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 it was never about Muslim brothers. This has been historical. All the Muslims have been fighting amongst themselves. Well, let, let's look at the history. let's look at uh, from the Afghan war and what happened and uh, the so-called Northern Alliance, how that formed after the Afghan war with the Russians, and then how that. And the, and the input of the proxy war from the Iranian side to the northern and the Indians in northern playing a proxy war against Pakistan and Iran playing Look, a proxy Saudi war. Saudi Arabia has always all, played a very important this. role in this region. So, so, so the cases so of Iran. This has built mindsets up from a long time. It's not something recent. It's not something new.
And we've got to accept that generally the northern areas of Afghanistan are generally prone to be against Pakistan because influences have generally been anti-Pakistani from those anti-Pakistani elements in, in India and even in Iran because they oppose certain aspects of what we do, primarily because we're pro-Saudi. Yeah. So when you've got that and it's pulled into people for many, many years, decades, you're going to have the automatic feeling against Pakistan. Even if there's nothing that Pakistan has done, it's automatically the bogeyman. Mm -hmm. This is the problem here. And this yeah. is a very and this has been, been a while. When I was there uh, many times, uh, I always felt that they were blaming Pakistan all the time, but that was under different times. Altogether. Even they do it now? I mean, that, but, the, but there's a consistency in that. And I, I, I even suggested uh, uh, that. Uh, uh, Hillman at the moment, look what happened when uh, Kunduz fell technically. Yeah. The but Taliban that, factor, I mean, they stayed there for about a week or so. Like, no, no, but, but Kunduz is a, in the north. Yeah, but, not, north. but Kunduz is a Pashtun populated area. But and this is a, historical significance in there because when Abdul Rahman Khan was there in the 1880s, he pushed the Ghazai Pashtun into the north. Number one, he got rid of people that were against him. Number two, he got an alliance from people in the north who were Pashtun. Now they're going to side with the Pashtun against the local so area. Pashtun populated area, but that means, but still, I mean, when you look at the geographic location, it's much away from Pakistan. I know. It's in the north of Afghanistan. Mental Western. linkages. But, but mental cultural linkages. linkages yeah. But yeah. now Ethnic you talk linkages. about Hillman. You, you yeah, just mentioned not, about it's, Kabul it's, also. It's not, it's not only, I think, uh, this is the old uh, narrative. So withdrawal of, of the American it troops works, or, or NATO it's forces. It is still, I think. Hassan Saab, withdrawal of the American forces or NATO from Afghanistan, was that a uh, wrong decision by the American administration? I think administration? it's, it's uh, uh, two, uh, I think the two, 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 what we call it, the losses to the Afghan government. So, I mean, one more, than, more than 100, or maybe, what's the exact number? Because the fighting has been going on in for the last two nights in, in, in Helmand. In Helmand, and more, more than, than 200 90, uh, uh, yeah. security personnel have been killed, and now 200 killed. means that there is something going on there. It's a big deal. And it's going on for weeks. Well, do you know it's the history of Helmand? Weeks, yeah. Do you know the history of Helmand? History of Helmand is uh, no British or no American could ever, you know, actually invade. No, Helmand is those those particular tribes, the Alize, which I'm proud of, by the way, <laughs> are resistant to change from anybody. So when the Taliban first went in there, um, uh, around uh, '94, they found the first major resistance came from, from that area. That tribe, who were the original horsemen of the invasion tribes into India and Pakistan, this region, and they resist <coughs> resist authority from anybody. So you've got a whole group of people and tribal people who resist control of the northern areas. Their dynamics are different there. It's not about religion. So Helmand it's about control from, from the north. From, from the other areas? Sorry, Helmand and Farah partially, yeah, together. Okay. It, it is not 100% lying down here and one people like this and the other people like that. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's a uh, diffused environment. And that's where the British tried to control with the American help. And they lost control many a time. Mm -hmm. And they had uh, Operation Mashtarek, which was actually a Dari Farsi name to an operation. And when the local population realized that, they thought it was an invasion from the north. Because you use a Farsi name, it's a Persian invasion mm -hmm. in a way. Mm -hmm. Mindset of people Mindset. is very different. Absolutely. It's a Pashtun local environment. Yes. You have an invasion from northern area. So they got the whole thing wrong, and it failed as an operation as well. And it's been consistently the worst area for any operation to occur when the Americans, the British, and the others occupied those areas to hold as well. Mm -hmm. So naturally, if you think about it, it's the first area to take back. Mm -hmm. And there are other things to take back there because it's the largest area of opium growth. 57,000 hectares well, were grown in that particular area. Um, and amongst others, and that provides income if you've got control of the local farmers. And the farm gate, farm gate uh, prices for opium there was, but is, is increasing now to an extent. And when that happens, there's a taxation on that, and the Taliban won. I mean, is it Taliban or it's another person, or another warlord, etc. So it's going to come somewhere, and they want to take, a, take some income from there as well. There's no doubt about that. Now, Hazmi, another important point. Now, when you talk about uh, the overall society, I mean, the different pockets, the Pashtun pockets, they're like Farsis, and you know, so on and so forth. I mean, Northern Alliance is a different ballgame. Uh, the Tajiks, they're Uzbeks. It has a very interesting uh, mix, by the way, Afghanistan. But they're talking about the overall control and authority at the moment. When you say Taliban, that doesn't mean that they're all Pashtuns. Uh -huh. no, they could be from any tribe. But this is a very wrong perception, by the way. Absolutely. So that means, you know, there's something wrong in almost every part of Afghanistan. Removal of forces, that me means that uh, it's a weak Afghanistan. When you talk about the capacity of their police or, for instance, their uh, military, national army, 
that's a joke and a half, to be very honest. So in certain circumstances, do you really think it's a very weak country and the fallout could be on Pakistan on an immediate basis the moment there's, there's something? For example, three, four, five provinces fell in the hands of the Taliban. I mean, that's a big deal. I mean, there's one attack and we talk about that for three days. So when you talk about five or six, maybe the, do you think the fallout could be on this side of, of the border too? Yeah, definitely, uh, because you know this border is is just uh, the it's an imaginary, almost an imaginary border. Seriously nothing speaking, underground, yeah. <laughs> nothing underground. But Faisal, you rightly said, I think this is not the Pashtuns, um, as Dr. Sub said that about the uh, no doubt um, uh, Kunduz is a Pashtun dominated area. But there are other areas like uh, like Bahlan, like mm -hmm. Farah, like uh, Farah. Uh, so yeah. these these uh, almost in the north and uh, in, in the suburbs of Kabul, like the north of Kabul. This uh, this Even in Shamali, Farah, more Shias I've heard than Sunni. It's called Shamali. I think this is in Pakistan, unfortunately, we have the long, uh, the long held narrative that it's only the Pashtuns which are dominating the Taliban. That's not the case. I was in Kabul, believe me, and the people who were deadly against mostly and speak against Pakistan the most were the Pashtuns, mostly the Pashtuns. Uh, I, I, I saw President Karzai more lethal than Dr. Uh, Dr. Abdullah, mm -hmm. and I saw many of the Pashtuns uh, who were more lethal talking against Pakistan than Dr. Abdullah. That is not the case. The problem for Afghan is that right at the moment they understand that their government is weak. They understand that their military is weak. There is not that much properly trained, they're pro properly equipped. Because you know, Faisal, American and NATO forces for almost fought against Taliban for, 20, uh, for, for 10 years, almost 10 years, having the most sophisticated machinery and have the license to kill. They couldn't, uh, they co they couldn't be able to control the, 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 the resurgence of Taliban, in, in, even in the north, in, in the south, in the center of the, of the country. That's a problem for them. But the, 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 uh, um, uh, Afghans believe that uh, Pakistan stopped supporting to them. And I think somehow, sometimes a uh, statement from Pakistan are coming out the way that when I was in Kabul, definitely I believe that, yes, mm -hmm. Pakistan is somehow uh, somehow in entrusted in, in, in putting Taliban uh, in the government uh, in, in, in Kabul. I think what <coughs> this is the problem for Pakistan also. In case, God forbid, if Taliban succeed across the border in Afghanistan, taking the Afghan uh, regime by force, so definitely that will have a and huge impact. Remember when, when, when Taliban took over Afghanistan, with the support of Pakistan and the American CIA, they were friends. Remember, they were friends. Ah, they were now friends. the narrative has changed. We are the frontline, uh, you know, country. In the yeah, war this is terror. unfortunate. The Pakistan are terrorists. So their guns won't be towards Russia. They'll be towards us. Mm -hmm. That is where the problem is. I think the Pakistan problem is that uh, hardly we 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 see things in national perspective or in national interest. So who thinks? You so rightly by said way? that. Anybody who thinks. And you rightly said in the beginning that unfortunately if we are fighting things we are fighting different. the war of Ummah. And in fact, there is no Ummah at all. Absolutely. Yeah, you look. You you talk about the Saudis' interest. Look at the Saudis coming up with 34 nation alliance, and everybody is saying that I am not aware of it. I am of the major your, countries. Your name, the name of Pakistan was included. Without even asking. Without, uh, uh, but also. they took it for granted <laughs> to put them in. And put, and and right, 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 right. What did the foreign office the reaction? Foreign office the first foreign reaction said, well, we, don't, we are not aware of any alliance. But, but you, know, you know, Pakistan is, it's, you know, I mean, when Richard Armitage came to Pakistan, and this is what we have heard, actually, that either you're with us or against okay, us. Yes, I mean, you don't want me back to the Stone Age. <laughs> Yeah, but that's the American problem. attitude, generally. You're with them, okay, that's great. There, there's so many, I mean, remittances, you talk about oil, you talk about so many other factors. Look, but if you're not with them, oh my God, what? Then there comes a statement from the deputy um, uh, UAE foreign minister, huh? and we don't, well, he said that in his personal capacity. For God's sake. For God's sake. <laughs> anyway, so thank you very much. Hasan Khas, it was a pleasure. Now, time to move on to our fourth segment, and that is about Pakistan Super League. It's about cricket. Let's watch the report. With 308 cricketers on board, the Pakistan Cricket Board kicked off players drafting in Lahore's National Cricket Academy. Pakistan's T20 skipper Shahid Afridi became the first pick of the Pakistan Super League after Peshawar Zalmi signed up the flamboyant all-rounder to play for its franchise. Karachi Kings didn't hesitate in signing up the former captain Shoaib Malik to play for them, while Quetta Gladiators got England star Kevin Peterson. But Lahore Kalandars perhaps made the most interesting pick for its franchise by signing West Indian hard hitter Chris Gale. Shane Watson of Australia was picked up by Islamabad United. The draft picks so far are Islamabad United picked up Ms. Baal Haq, and Mohammed Irfan of Pakistan, Andre Russell and Samuel Badri of West Indies, Shane Watson and Brad Haddon of Australia.
Karachi Kings picked Shoaib Malik, Suhail Tanvir and Ahmad Wasim of Pakistan, Shakib Al Hassan of Bangladesh, Ravi Bupara of England, and Lendl Simmons of West Indies. Lahore Kalandars picked Omar Akmal, Mohammad Rizwan, Yasser Shah, and Suhail Maksud of Pakistan, also picking Chris Gale and Dwayne Bravo of West Indies. Peshawar Zalmi picked Shahid Afridi, Wahab Riaz, Kamran Akmal, and Mohammad Afiz of Pakistan. Peshawar team also picked Darren Sami of West Indies and Chris Jordan of England. Quetta Gladiators selected Ahmed Shahzad, Safraz Ahmed, and Anwar Ali of Pakistan, also picking Kevin Peterson of England and Luke Wright from England, and Jason Holder of West Indies in the draft today. Each team will be required to pick three players per category from each of the top three categories, Platinum, Diamond, and Gold. While drafting of two emerging players will be mandatory, a team will also be able to pick up to five players from the silver category in order to complete the squad. Each team will have a minimum of four foreign players in the playing 11. The inaugural edition of the PSL is scheduled to take place from February 4th through the 23rd, 2016 in Dubai and Sharjah. Noman, uh, to talk about this, he's a known cricket expert. Dr. Salam, assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam, how are you? I'm good, Dr. Saab. Thank you very much for asking. Dr. Saab, whenever we talk about cricket, we always hear from various people that, you know, the infrastructure yeah. isn't there, but the talent is there. We need to make sure that, you know, there should be a lot of cricket in Pakistan so the talent comes up and we can actually pick up the right people for the right task when it comes to the national level. Now, sir, my question right. is that this Pakistan Super League is going to promote that kind of cricket which was already missing at the very basic level and now you'll find some great talent uh, well uh, first and foremost i don't agree with this uh, uh, notion that uh, pakistan uh, is even now filled with talent because now the world has moved on and it's about not only the natural talent but also the acquired talent and for the acquired talent you need to have the infrastructure at the grassroots so which is uh, abysmally missing uh, in pakistan at least now, if you come to the Pakistan Super League, and if we discuss about the emerging players, unfortunately, ironically, and regrettably, what uh, we did, that to adjust the top performers of the T20, those who had some credibility in marketing in this brand of the game, we picked uh, people like a 39-year-old Tariq Hassan as an emerging player. So yeah, that's not that. going to give you. That's not going to give you the key uh, for the future. And uh, secondly, if you are going to make foreign pl players as the icon then uh, they are not going to be the role models for the newer generation in this country. And uh, just to compensate uh, people like Chris Gale and uh, Shane Watson uh, and Kevin Peterson, because they were not agreeing to the platinum uh, uh, minimum amount of $140,000 to make it $200,000, you made them the icons and you left you know, people like Ms. Bernhardt and Yunus Khan out of the fray. So these are the contradictions, but I personally feel that if PSL uh, has the kickstart and if it gets going, by the time enough revenue, it should generate enough revenue uh, actually to, to bring our domestic cricket infrastructure in place. So when it comes to, like, uh, because, you know, Roksha, at the end of the day, it's all about marketing, it's all about money, it's all about, uh, you know, having more facilities. Do you think we'll be able to gener generate enough to actually invest some of that into the basic infrastructure, sir? Well, uh, again, uh, we should not uh, leave the touch of reality. fact is that Pakistan isn't a great uh, uh, upmarket like you see in India or uh, uh, even in South Africa. Uh, so uh, we will always be handicapped when it comes to the Pakistan market and the influx of money and uh, the franchises investing in uh, such a league. And this venture, uh, you must know, that is not being held in Pakistan for various reasons. It's being uh, held uh, in the Emirates. And uh, two of uh, the parties, one uh, the franchise owning the Lahore Kalandas and the other uh, owning Islamabad, they both are offshore parties. So you, you, you need to understand that unless until it becomes a brand and its brand value increases, and its brand value will only increase because even the top players attracted to PSL, they are not people like Brendan McCullum or uh, uh, David Warner or an A.B. De Villiers or a Hashim Amla or a Dale Stane. So uh, in order to catch uh, those players, you need to invest more. And if you have to invest more, you should have a more financial base. So that exactly. becomes a cash 22 situation. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Saab. Top players, you are not going to have you. Absolutely. But, Dr. Saab, let's at least something has started. Let's take it as an experience. And at least we'll learn what we have done wrong and what we have done good. 
what needs to be done in order to make oh. it a better, you know, platform for better players well, to Sankal, come and play. It's, it's not only about experience. I think it is the best thing that is going to happen to Pakistan cricket because okay. it is going to be the reintroduction of Pakistan cricket in the international market. Mm -hmm. And we all wish to keep our fingers crossed. This should happen. PSL should take place because it's eventually going to get its roots, roots strong and we Absolutely. can have an evolving sports culture. All right. Dr. Sir, thank you very much, sir. You take care of yourself. And, uh, and that's all we have for this hour. I'll see you again. Till then, you take care of yourself. Khuda Hafiz.